Here we're going to take a detailed look at the mechanism and stereochemistry of bimolecular nucleophilic substitution, better known as SN2. The SN2 reaction is concerted, meaning it takes place in a single elementary step, and this has important stereochemical implications that we can actually trace to the key orbital interaction involved in the step. The SN2 reaction tends to be more rapid for sterically unhindered electrophiles, for reasons that will become clear in a second. In an SN2 process, the nucleophile forms a bond to the electrophilic atom at the same time the leaving group or nucleophuge departs with a pair of electrons. In the transition state for the SN2 reaction, partial bonds exist to both the leaving group, here bromine, and the nucleophile, here phenoxide. The atoms linked to the electrophilic carbon not directly involved in the reaction assume a geometry that's approximately trigonal planar, halfway between the two tetrahedral configurations of the starting materials and products, as we'll see. Here, a CH3 group and two hydrogens are linked to the electrophilic carbon in addition to the bromine atom. In the products of this step, the phenoxide group is linked to the electrophilic carbon and Br- is a byproduct. Notice that negative charge is transferred from phenoxide in the starting materials to bromide in the products. This means that in the transition state, bromine has a partial negative charge and phenoxide has a partial negative charge. And there's a net transfer of charge in this direction as the step occurs. To draw a reaction coordinate diagram for this process, we first need to figure out which side of the reaction is favored thermodynamically. And if you recall our previous discussions of stability trends, you know what molecules to look at to make this decision, the ions. We want to compare the stability of the phenoxide anion with the bromide anion. And we could do this a number of ways using a quantitative or qualitative or structural approach. In this particular case, the pKa's of the corresponding conjugate acids are highly informative. The pKa of phenol, the conjugate acid of phenoxide, is about 10. And the pKa of HBr, which we're vaguely familiar with from studies of strong acids, is somewhere well below zero. The fact that HBr is a much stronger acid than phenol tells us that the conjugate base of HBr is much more stable than the conjugate base of phenol. In other words, bromide is much more stable than phenoxide. This means that the favored side of the reaction is the product side. And this shouldn't be surprising, considering that we've previously identified Br- as a good leaving group. Notice that our criterion for good leaving groups, that their conjugate acids have pKa's less than zero, guarantees that any nucleophile whose conjugate acid has a pKa greater than zero is going to react favorably with molecules containing good leaving groups. Having made this determination of the favored side, we can now place the reactants and products on a reaction coordinate diagram, with the products lower in energy than the reactants. The transition state will come somewhere along the reaction coordinate between these two and will have higher energy than both of them. And in this case, since the reactants are higher in energy to start with, the transition state will be somewhat closer to the reactants than it is to the products. And this has some somewhat subtle effects on the structure of the transition state. For example, since we're closer to the reactants, we should expect the bond to bromine to be slightly shorter than the bond to phenoxide. In addition, the geometry at the electrophilic carbon still looks a little bit tetrahedral. In other words, there's still a little bit of an umbrella type of shape formed by the two hydrogens and the CH3. That looks something like this with the two hydrogens and the CH3 still canted slightly as they would be in the tetrahedral geometry, but on their way to becoming trigonal planar and passing through to the opposite tetrahedral configuration. One last thing to notice on this slide is that the nucleophile approaches the carbon leaving group bond from behind it or from its backside. This direction of attack has important stereochemical consequences in cases when the electrophilic carbon is a stereocenter. SN2 substitution results in an inversion of configuration at the electrophilic carbon. More specifically, the nucleophile is located on the opposite side of the three other groups linked to the carbon from the side that the leaving group was on originally. Ultimately, the idea of backside attack comes from the key orbital interaction involved in the SN2 elementary step. The relevant orbitals here are a non-bonding orbital on the nucleophile and the sigma star orbital of the carbon leaving group bond. So I want to look at a hypothetical example where the nucleophile is the conjugate base of the leaving group. 
so that ignoring stereochemistry, we end up with a product that has the same connectivity as the starting material. This starting material contains a stereocenter with three different hypothetical groups, A, B, and C, linked to the electrophilic carbon along with the leaving group. The curved arrows for S and 2 imply the orbitals involved. A non-bonding lone pair orbital on the nucleophile, which I'm showing here in red, and the sigma star or sigma antibonding orbital of the carbon leaving group bond, which I'm showing here in blue. The key to backside attack is that the nucleophile prefers to approach the largest lobe of the unfilled orbital within the electrophile, and this is on the back side or on the outside of the carbon leaving group bond. And furthermore, the lobe is larger on carbon than it is on the atom actually serving as the leaving group because carbon is less electronegative than the atom that departs with a pair of electrons, essentially by definition. This donation of electron density from the nucleophile to the backside of the carbon leaving group bond leads to a kind of umbrella flip. And just to clarify this, I'm going to outline the leaving group that departed in blue and draw the product of this group departing, in other words, the conjugate base of that specific group in blue on the product side. I'm also going to highlight the leaving group atom, quote unquote, that served as a nucleophile in red, and we can draw it on the product side in red as well with its new bond to the electrophilic carbon. In the SN2 step, the groups A, B, and C linked to the electrophilic carbon fold over like so. And this results in a change of configuration at this stereocenter. This is straightforward to prove using hypothetical priorities. Let's say that the leaving group was priority 1, A was priority 2, B was 3, and C was 4. In this case, this stereocenter has the R configuration. And I'll leave it up to you to visualize that, but if you look at the stereocenter from this direction, you'll see that fairly easily. In the products, the priorities are still the same. The leaving group is still 1, A is 2, B is 3, and C is 4. However, the configuration here is S rather than R, and I'll leave it up to you to verify that once again. Notice that this starting material and this product are enantiomers of each other as well. Of course, this umbrella flipping of the groups A, B, and C and going from reactants to products occurs regardless of whether the electrophilic atom is a stereocenter or not. So it's important to keep in mind as a general feature of SN2 reactions. But it's most important when the electrophilic carbon is a stereocenter, and it may not necessarily lead to a change in configurational label, since if the nucleophile is structurally different from the leaving group, prioritizations will change in going from reactants to products. The important point is that the nucleophile in the products ends up linked to the opposite side of the plane formed by A, B, and C than the leaving group was positioned in the original reactant. This reaction scheme shows this process for a somewhat more complicated example with a phenyl ring, methyl, and a hydrogen linked to the electrophilic carbon. And here's a three-dimensional image that shows the trajectory of the nucleophile, here SH- as it approaches the electrophile. Pay close attention to what happens to the hydrogen, methyl group, and phenyl ring as this step occurs, and notice where the sulfur ends up relative to where the chlorine was positioned originally. Notice that in the product, the sulfur is positioned on the opposite side of the plane formed by the phenyl ring, hydrogen, and methyl group than the chlorine was in the original reactant. This is the essence of inversion of configuration, and you should always visualize backside attack whenever you know an SN2 mechanism is operating. It's a good practice to get into even for substrates that don't contain a stereocenter at the electrophilic position.